This is Sign Language with Bruce Williams and Doc Goldstein. Hi, and welcome to episode 165 of Sign Language. This is Bruce Williams from SignLanguagePodcast.com. Hey, this is Doc. How are everybody? <laughs> How are you? I'm good. Excellent. I'm good. Man, it sounds like you and I have both had similarly crazy busy weeks. Oh, man. I, I, I have been so busy. I've been mixing a lot of stuff, and it's just taking up a lot of time. And, and I take a lot of breaks when I mix because to keep my ears from getting all compressed. So it yep. takes a while, and, I, and, I, and I've been busy. And I've been doing different styles of music, which is a good thing. But yeah, nice. nevertheless, I, you know. So what styles of music are you, you know, mixing at the moment? Well, we did one group that was a quartet of saxophone players, wow. uh, all extremely good, very professional, and they do a lot of different styles of music. They do classical, but they do jazz, and they do swing. They do a whole bunch of different stuff, and they're just really great. Nice. Uh, I've also been doing uh, a couple of different groups that do sound-alikes. Oh, okay. So they sound like other groups. Like one song they did was Brick House by the Commodores, and this other group, they've been doing a lot of good stuff. So it's been interesting because both of these groups want me to listen back to the original versions and have my mixes for them informed by what I hear there. So I've been doing a lot of going back and listening to how these songs are originally mixed, and sometimes it's not pretty, I'll just tell you. <laughs> so there have been times when, I, when I've referenced that, and then I've just gone ahead and ignored it. Yep. And then once in a while, there are times when there's some good ideas there, and I follow those. So either way, it's kind of great because it's kind of fun and challenging sometimes to try to figure out what somebody else did. And uh, sometimes it works. Sometimes the fact that it's different players and different singers than what the original did means that you can't always go exactly where they went. Yeah. But it certainly is educational. The, so it's been fun. The funny thing about that whole mentality of, you know, we want you to go back and listen to the original and have, you know, the mix that you do in 2017 be informed by this mix that was done in 1964, kind of strikes me as being a little narrow focused in the sense that some of the decisions about the way the song was mixed in 1964 may simply have been limitations of the technology of the time, and we no longer have to play within those, you know, constraints. Well, I think that's completely valid. What's even more interesting is when they want me to uh, copy a, a style of a mix from something that was done in the 80s or 90s, where there's more sophisticated th stuff going on. Yeah. Things like gated snare tails and, uh, you know, reverb <laughs> tails and things like that. Nonlinear reverb. And, yeah. and then there's some songs where they've obviously used auto-tune from hell, you know, on there. So <laughs> yeah. it, re it reminds me of the, there's, a, there's an old wives tale about uh, a, a, a newly married couple and, whenever the wife would prepare a roast, she would cut an inch off each end of the roast before she put it in the oven. And her husband says to her, why do you do that? And she goes, um, I don't know. She said, it's something my mum always did, and, and I, I'm not really sure why. She always said it made it taste better. And so <laughs> the next time they were at the, the mother-in-law's house, the, the wife says, mum, my husband asked me why it is that you cut an inch off each end of the the roast before you put it in the oven. <laughs> and the mother says, oh, wow. She said, I haven't done that since, ooh, I don't know, about 1955. <laughs> and she said, well, why would you stop doing it? She said, I got a bigger baking pan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so... Okay, I just have to tell you a little story. So when I was little, my mom used to put a little milk in the scrambled eggs when she was making it. Yep, I still and do I that. thought then that she was doing it. Yeah, I do that. And I do that now, and I do it with French toast and whatever. And looking back on it, I think she did it to make the eggs last longer. But, <laughs> Quite you know, possibly. I grew up thinking that she did it because, it, you know, that's how it, it tasted good. So now, to me, it tastes good. But yeah. I think that looking back on it, I think she was just, you know, being cheap. Yeah. 
Well, that's quite possibly. I mean, coming off the back end of the Second World War when people were a little bit shorter of money and you had to make things last longer. So, it, you know, it was probably a perfectly valid way of, of getting more scrambled eggs with using less eggs. <laughs> probably so, probably so. But somebody who knows more about cooking will probably write in and tell us we're both wrong, but that's fine. <laughs> So the idea for this episode was that we would cover stereo miking techniques. Actually, you know what? Before we get to that, Doc, we had an outstanding question from the last episode. And this was something that I noticed when I was editing that episode. You mentioned the idea of flipping the polarity on the bottom snare drum mic and it, it occurred oh, to me yeah, that we, yeah, didn't, yeah. we didn't really address why you would do that and i thought you know we should probably uh just quickly address that before we uh, head on down the path of stereo miking did you want to cover why that's a good idea yeah well first of all it's a good idea to listen to it with the bottom fla- phase or bottom polarity actually flipped and not flipped but the, the concept is, is that you have the microphone facing the opposite direction, so it's going to get an, an out-of-polarity signal relative to the top microphone. You've got the bottom microphone pointed up at the snare, and you've got the top microphone pointed down at the snare. And so since those microphones are getting out-of-polarity signals, that only makes sense if you want them to add up and do one fat snare, is to flip the polarity on the bottom one. Yep. You know, uh, I guess you could flip the polarity on the top one. It depends if you have other mics facing up. Suppose you have microphones uh, faced underneath the tom-toms and the, you don't have a bottom head on the toms and you've got the mic stuck up there, then maybe you would flip the top snare. But that's the concept. The mic is facing the opposite direction, so the polarity is going to be different, so go ahead and flip it. It's kind of like if you were to have, if you had an orchestra and you mic'd everybody from the front except the French horns, you mic from the back, yep. which sometimes will happen, and you might tr- try that there. But again... Your ears have to decide, you know, if you if you do that and your ears tell you that you like the sound better of the mic not being flipped, then by all means. But make sure that you listen to it, that you have good mono compatibility. And yeah. so let me get on my soapbox just for a second. For sure. Mono compatibility. Here we are in the world of Dolby Atmos, which is fantastic. <laughs> and yeah. Five. I'm. I'm not being. You know. I'm not being sarcastic. I'm serious. You know. Yeah. Dolby Atmos is great. It's a great format and uh, complicated, but great. Yeah. And we've got seven one. You know, films and five point one films and all these things. Why do we care about mono compatibility? Well, here's an example. Suppose you record a stereo guitar. Might be appropriate for today's discussion later in the podcast. Mm-hmm. If I were you, if I were the listeners out there, I would make sure that that also sounds good in mono because I had a band come to me recently and play their album for me that they were just about to release, and they did have one track where there was a stereo guitar, and in mono the guitar pretty much canceled itself out and disappeared in mono, Ouch. and it sounded great in stereo, but you know, <laughs> so I said to them, well they, well, they said, well, why do we care? People are going to be listening on earbuds. You know, who cares? Well, yeah, but what happens if you're at Walmart one day or some other department store, Target or whatever, Yeah. and all of a sudden that song comes on and they're playing it in mono because it's a big box store and they don't have perfect stereo everywhere, so they pump all this stuff out in mono and there's no guitar because you didn't check that when you did the mix. Yeah. What's going to happen, you know? You don't want that phone call, right? No. <laughs> and what happens if it's on the radio and somebody hears it in mono on the radio because of whatever is happening at the radio station or whatever your you know, reception is or whatever else can go wrong? Or who knows? It could be end up in a TV show and, they're, and they've done a mono version because they've got it coming out of a car speaker in some scene where people are in a car talking and that yep. music is playing. I mean, there's a billion reasons why somebody might hear it in mono. Yeah. You got to make sure that it's compatible, even in today's world. So, which leads me to the next question. You had sent me an email asking if we had answered somebody's question. Yeah. And that was about transformers. But he asked a que- another question, and he had mentioned that he had his room treated acoustically so that it sounded pretty flat in there, that he had a good frequency response. Yep. I, um, and that just got me thinking. There is a website called RPG Inc., rpginc.com, and that's a company called RPG that makes acoustic materials for 
industry and for recording studios and for whatever. And I invite anybody who wants to know more about how to treat their room to look at that website and read about diffusion. Because if all you have in your room is soft materials at different frequency responses, say you've got bass traps and you've got some stuff that sucks up mid-range and you've got some foam that takes care of high end, but you don't have any hard surfaces with a randomized bounce pattern, then you're going to get a room that might have a flat frequency response, but you don't want it to sound completely dead. So you want to have some bounce in there, but you want that bounce to be randomized by bouncing against an uneven surface that's designed for that. So I would just... You know, I'm no, I know I'm going off topic and I apologize, but I would just say that no, no, for those fine. who are treating their rooms at home to at least read about diffusion and to use that, like in the ceiling, for example. Right. Uh, so just, just be informed. Uh, and it's not all about sucking up all the frequencies in the room. It's really not. It's about being able to have, if you, if you handle the diffusion properly, a smaller room can sound not so small because you don't have that bounce going back and forth between parallel services that is a dead giveaway for bedroom studios. Yeah, just standing waves, yeah. Indeed. So are you are you thinking of this in relation to the room in which you record or are you thinking more of a mix room or both? Both, really. Right. But you know, if you're yeah. in a mixed environment that's less than perfect, but you know, you've got your speakers close to your head and they're good near field speakers you can sometimes kind of get used to what you're hearing. Yeah. And I'm not recommending, I'm not recommending that, but I mean, you can get by if you have to, but a drum set, for example, I wouldn't want to record a drum set in a room that's completely dead. I mean, that would sound like the (laughs) seventies. Yeah. All right. So onto the stereo miking experiment. I had a yarn with one of the guys that I work with at the radio station who had a a nice Maton acoustic guitar. Uh, He was happy to come and sit in my studio for an hour and, you know, play me some little bits and pieces, you know, every few minutes as I set up different stereo miking uh, techniques. And uh, and it, it was interesting because a lot of it was new information even to him he's an engineer as well uh not been an engineer for as long as i have and he was quite intrigued by some of the things that i was setting up and so what i what i did was i I hit a few websites in advance and you know searched for stereo miking techniques to see what techniques were out there apart from the ones that i already knew you know what were the ones that i wasn't familiar with. Uh, I really only came across one that I'd not heard of before. And that one I actually didn't find on a website. I found it in a previous edition of Audio Technology Magazine, which is an Australian publication uh, that comes out six times That's a year. That's a good magazine. and I like that magazine. I've read that a few times. It's a really good magazine. It's really nice. And, and that was the Faulkner Phased Array. Uh, which we'll get to in a minute. So what I what I decided was uh, obviously X Y. That's your coincident pair. That would be uh, an obvious choice. Uh, we could look at spaced pairs. Obviously mid side, uh, which is quite a complicated uh, arrangement. Uh, the Bloom Line pair, uh, the Faulkner phased array, and then O R T F, which was uh, a French creation, which uh, we'll get to in a minute as well. So what I said to Dan, the guy that brought in his guitar, was just sit there. Once I've got, you know, each mic configuration set up, uh, I'll just get you to play maybe eight bars of whatever you feel like playing and then just let it ring out. And so that's what we did. We went through all of these different stereo micing configurations. I had him play a little, you know, 10 to 15 second piece and then let it ring out at the end. Now, he said to me, do you want me to play the same thing or do you want me to play something different? And I said, oh, no, vary it up. That's fine. In hindsight, I'm kind of thinking maybe I should have got him to play the same piece over and over again uh, just for consistency of source. But I figured if I'd done that, there were going to be 
different nuances to each performance anyway. So that's kind of why I gave him the free reign to just say, look, yeah, just play whatever you feel like playing just for eight bars, you know. So I've recorded all of these samples, which we're about to listen to. I will, when I post the show notes for this episode, include download links uh, or a probably just be one link to a, a big zip file. And I will put in that zip file not only stereo renders of what I've recorded, but I will also put the source files in WAV format. So if anybody wants to download them, maybe I'll put them as separate zip files, but check the show notes. They'll be there anyway in one form or another. So if you want to download the source WAV files and then drop them into your DAW of choice and have a listen to you know, what we recorded and play around with the stereo fields of you know, the different techniques, by all means, knock yourselves out. Consider these recordings open source, if you like. And uh, yeah, I figured this would be a, a, a good experiment. And I found it a, an interesting experiment uh, myself. When I came to mixing them down, I included on the master output of Reaper Isotope's Insight plugin. Oh. Now, Insight is a metering plugin. It doesn't do anything to the audio. Like, so it's not processing the audio, it's not processing what you actually hear. All it is is a suite of tools which give you visual feedback on everything going on with your audio. So there's a, a spectrum analysis, there's a stereo field analysis, uh, there's, you know, LUFS, LKFS metering options. There's all, all different tools which give you a visual representation of what your audio is doing. Now, Insight is available in Ozone Advanced, but it's not in the regular Ozone product. So Ozone is Isotope's mastering plugin. The current version, which is version 7, uh, I haven't gone and checked the pricing, but I think the last time I looked, the standalone version of Ozone was about 399 US, and I think the advanced version is maybe 599. Uh, I'll, I'll have to check those prices, but I will put links uh, for anyone that's interested in uh, I, um, Insight. You can buy it as a separate plugin, I believe. And so what I did was when I was playing these recordings, you know, ready to run out rendered mixes, I was watching the stereo scope in Insight. And what intrigued me was how differently that stereo scope represented what was going on in the stereo sphere, if you like, with each different microphone technique. I found that a very interesting thing. So I actually took screenshots as each one was playing through, and those screenshots will be in the show notes of this episode as well. So, uh, yeah. Doc, you, you've got some experience with XY? I do. I have a little experience with MS as well. Right. Cool. So you can you can answer some questions that I've got regarding MS when we get to that. <laughs> so in what sure. in what uh, context have you done stereo recording? Well, we used it on the scoring stage back in the day when um, I wasn't behind the console, except a couple of times I did a couple of scores, but usually I wasn't behind the console. But we did a lot of that. Right. Uh, some engineers or producers would want to come in and do MS recording, or Decatry was used with one engineer who I'm not sure I can mention his name or not, but he's just amazing. And he's such a gentleman and such a great, great engineer. But in any event, the sound he got out of a decatry was just great. But also we used, you know, spot mics. So if right. violins had mics and, you know, the cellos had mics and everybody had mics. But there are those out there who want to use a stereo pair as XY, for example, since that's the simplest to record maybe a string quartet or an orchestra or a jazz band or something like that. And I would just say that, great, but if you're relying on an XY pair, you're also relying on the fact that the acoustics of the room you're in are good because you have no way to change it if they're not really because you're not using any spot mics. So that's a whole nother kettle of fish, as it were. Um, 
you can't always trust the room you're in. Sometimes you need to use more mics than that so that you can use artificial ambience later to make it sound like it's uh, as authentic as you want. You don't want to give away the fact that you're using tools, but that's not what this show is about. This is about different forms of stereo miking. So assuming that you're in, you know, a, a fantastic room acoustically like the Disney Concert Hall or Berlin Philharmonic, that's pretty good. But if you're recording an orchestra in a storage container, that's a problem. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. Now, one thing I found in my reading up about XY was the generally accepted approach to XY or coincident recording is two cardioid polar pattern microphones at 90 degrees to each other with the capsules as close as possible to each other, uh, generally one above the other, so that they are pointing, you know, just slightly left and right of the sound source that you're recording, assuming your sound source is a spot source right in front. Now, I also found in my reading that some people use a 135-degree arc between the capsules rather than a 90-degree arc. Is this something you've ever encountered, Doc? And if so, why? Uh, you know, I just stick with 90 degrees. Uh, I haven't really tried using uh, different degrees. But, you know, if you did use a little more, um, that's what pan pots are for. You know, if you don't like what you get, right? Well, I guess at 135 degrees, you could always pan them back in to narrow it down, couldn't you? Sure. But, of course, you don't have the type of control you have with MS, which I'm sure you'll talk about soon, where you can select sure. the center versus the sides. But typically, I just go with 90 degrees, and that works for uh, small ensembles and giant bands, you know, giant orchestras as well. So Yeah, right. However, I don't record unless I have to. Like, if I'm at a live, if I'm recording a live concert, and there's no way to put microphones amongst the musicians, and I can't do it because of sightline issues or audience issues or whatever, then I don't do it. But I try to always have more microphones than just an XY, but that's yeah. not what we're talking about today. So, But XY is a great starting point, and I always make sure they're the same type of microphones as well. Yeah, Like, for, I typically would use a Neumann KM184s for that, Right, but I've also had good luck with other microphones as well. So Right, so as you will see in the notes that I've posted along with this episode, uh, for this first sample, I used a Rode NT4. Now, the NT4 is a single-bodied microphone which has two cardioid capsules mounted at 90 degrees on the top of it, and they are not movable. This thing is designed as a stereo microphone with the two capsules in a fixed position, so I figured, well, hey, I've got this mic at my disposal. It belongs in the mic cupboard at work. I might as well give it a go. And uh, the interesting thing, because it's a stereo microphone, it cannot get by with a simple three-pin cannon plug on the bottom of it because your standard three-pin cannon plug only carries a mono signal. So on the bottom of this microphone is a five-pin plug, and it comes with its own dedicated microphone cable which has the single five pin plug on the end which attaches to the microphone and then it goes out to a Y configuration with two standard XLR male plugs to go into your mic preamps. So I sadly failed to take a photograph uh, of the studio as I had this set up but imagine as you're looking at the photos that I took later in the session where Dan is sitting there playing his guitar, I had this NT4 laid flat, pointed pretty much at the spot in between the hole in the guitar and where the neck enters onto the body of the guitar. So it was sort of not quite pointed at the hole, just a little bit more towards the neck than that. So let's have a listen to that sample and, uh, and then we'll move on.
Now, I would like to point out that what you are hearing has been encoded to an MP3 for delivery of this podcast. I am hoping, uh, I certainly don't think it'll be an issue with the XY stuff, that the MP3 codec doesn't mess with the stereo imaging. And that is why I'm going to include a download link to the source files for anyone that wants to download this and actually have a listen to the WAVs so you're not hearing any MP3 artifacts or... You know, because I encode my podcasts using joint stereo, there's a possibility that the codec might do some weird things with some of these stereo samples. So I just wanted to bring that, you know, out and put it on the table so everyone knows. Sorry, Doc, you were going to say something? I was just going to say that for me, this is interesting because as I've said in past conversations, I'm a bit of a Rode fan. I have seven Rode microphones, but I don't have that one. Yep. So I, that's interesting from my perspective. Right. Yeah, it's it's quite a nice mic, and I'm I've got an acoustic session happening with an artist next Friday, uh, an artist who's coming in from the UK. They're coming through town on a promo tour, and I was under the impression that they were going to be in yesterday, which was Friday for me. Uh, it turned out that somewhere along the line we got our wires crossed, and I had the wrong week, and so I am planning uh, when this artist comes through of putting this NT4 up as a room mic as far from the artist as I can. Nice. That's a nice idea. Just to see, you know, how it goes. Yeah, I figure what the hell, you know, I've got the inputs, I've got the mics, might as well just slap it up there and see what we get. Uh, I've mentioned uh, on this podcast before that I am a big fan of using a room mic to feed into a reverb plugin. If I want some more sense of space in a mix, rather than putting the spot mics through a reverb, I'll put the room mic through the reverb because there's already a natural distance to what the room mic is hearing. And so putting that through a reverb, I don't know, it's just been my experience. It comes across as a slightly more believable sense of acoustic space than putting the close mics through the reverb plugin. Have you ever toyed with that? Yeah, that makes that makes sense to me. That makes sense to me. Um, I, I have pl- I have played with that. And another thing that I also will try doing sometimes is if the room mics are not omnidirectional, if they're if I for whatever reason just have cardioid mics, sometimes I'll aim them directly away from the sound source to increase the ambience and have less direct sound through them. Uh, and that also can be very helpful. Yeah. So you're picking up more of the reflections off the walls. Right. Yeah, nice. Okay, so we'll move on to the second sample. So this was, uh, again, XY, and this was at 135 degrees. For this particular approach, I switched to my Rode M5 matched pair. Now, these are small pencil condenser microphones. They're only about 10 or 12 centimeters long and, yeah, maybe a inch across and they come as a matched pair you buy them in a box the two of them have come from the factory with a certificate that states that yes these microphones have been measured and calibrated at the factory and are you know guaranteed to be within a you know squillionth of a db you know aligned to each other in terms of frequency response and sensitivity and all that sort of stuff so what I have bought is Rode sells a stereo mounting bar. And this is just a little plastic uh, bar that you can screw onto the 3 8 inch thread on top of a mic stand. Uh, and I've also got a little tilt ball head thing that was actually designed as a photographic accessory that I quite often put in between the top of the mic stand and the base of this stereo mounting bar and that allows me to rotate the mounting bar through well even more than 360 degrees because you can swivel it to the sides as well as front and back and it allows me to put my mics into any position that I want when they're on top of a mic stand. Uh, So what I did was I used this stereo mounting bar. Uh, It's got slots in it that allow you to move the mic clips in or out towards the center. And it has markings on the bar uh, just in, you know, in white ink that specify certain degrees, certain distances. Some of the common 
setups like ORTF and uh, XY are already marked on the bar for you. So you can just undo the little swivel clamp on the bottom, move the mic clip to the right spot, rotate it to exactly the right angle based on the markings that are on the bar, uh, and then just tighten up the swivel clamp and off you go. You, you, it's all good. So that was what I did for this second sample. The X, XY at 135 degrees, I've simply used my M5 matched pair, uh, 135 degree angle in between the two capsules, and this is what it sounds like. You know, that microphone that you're talking about, to me, looks like their knockoff version of a KM-184. You know, it's the same rough dimensions, and it just looks to me like like it's, it's you know, Rhodes' attempt to to do a KM-184. And I'm not knocking Rhodes because uh, I'm sure the mic sounds good, but, you know. Oh, they're lovely. I think they're, you know, but I'm sure they're after the KM-184 vibe. And there's nothing wrong with uh, copying, you know, the best, right? Yeah, absolutely. What, what is it they say? Uh, uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery or something? Right, right. So I have no doubt they probably were pursuing exactly that kind of target. So so anyway, we'll move on to spaced pairs. Now, the thing about spaced pairs is the idea here is that you use microphones which are identical uh, in their polar pattern and hopefully in their brand and model, but the trap for young players with spaced pairs is making sure uh, we spoke earlier about mono compatibility is making sure that the sound source whatever it may be is equal distance to both capsules where this can bite you on the butt is if you have one microphone that is slightly further from the sound source than the other and what that will cause is phase issues. Now, uh, I was very pleased to hear Doc a few minutes ago mention polarity when he was indeed referring to polarity because it is a major bugbear of mine when people refer to the phase switch on a desk. It's not a phase switch, it's a polarity switch. Phase relates to time. Polarity <laughs> relates to... <laughs> You're laughing, but you agree with me, right? Here, here. Well, I do agree with you. Here, here, you know. Because <laughs> if it was uh, a phase switch, it'd be like that little... There are, there are boxes that will adjust continuous phase, like Little Labs, for example, makes a box that'll do that. But yes, the, the 180 out of phase switch on a desk is a polarity switch. Exactly. That is correct. Because phase... You know, if you if you really want to get into the weeds and get technical about it, relates to time, where polarity simply relates to an inversion of the values of the voltage at any given point in time. So, you know, your positive voltages become negative voltages, your negative voltages become positive voltages. You are simply flipping the waveform upside down, but it has nothing to do with the actual time of arrival of that signal. You know, phase means you are, you are either delaying the arrival of a signal or you are advancing the arrival of a signal. Would you agree with that, Doc? Sure. And I'd also say that everybody knows that a negative voltage is a voltage with a bad attitude. <laughs> nice. Nice. <laughs> so the thing about space pairs, yeah, if you have one microphone that is slightly closer to the sound source, then the sound is going to arrive at the microphone, which is you know, marginally closer, just a little bit earlier than it arrives at the other microphone. You know, the microphone, which is slightly further away, is going to receive the same you know, transient, if you like, of, of any given sound just that little bit later than the mic, which is a bit closer. So spaced pairs, if you're going to do this, make sure that you, I mean, some people would say be, be super anal and actually have a tape measure and measure the distance from the sound source to the capsule. I think you can generally do it visually if you've got half an eye on you. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I just have to say, I've, I've never pulled out a tape measure on a client, you know. <laughs> no, me either. <laughs> 
you know, they might get the wrong idea besides. I have seen some people say that they use a tape measure. I've certainly seen it when uh, guys are putting microphones up over drum kits. Uh, so, <laughs> Well, sure, because there's a very famous engineer from England who, you, who, who does, he doesn't use a tape measure, but he does make sure he has his floor tom mic and his other mic uh, equidistant from the snare. So when he brings it both up, the snare is in the center and, and all of that. Yeah. And that's all perfectly valid. You know, while we're on the subject of spaced pair, mm-hmm. just think about it for a minute. Somebody might be wondering, why do you have to have the mics when you're XY as close together as possible, the capsules as close together? And why do you have to be so careful with spaced pair? Well, think about the fact that the distance between those capsules, when you go to mono, if there's a waveform that is like a high frequency because the mics are close but not close enough, and say it's 10K or, you know, 2,000 cycles or something like that, and it's equal to the distance between those two capsules and you go to mono, well, you're liable to put a notch in that frequency, and that's what you have to watch out for. So you just have to make sure... Because, you know, some of this stuff, you can be wrong, and it'll sound fantastic in stereo. It might even sound wider than the speakers, which is a dead giveaway that you have a phase problem if that happens. You know, that's, so I'd be really careful about that, and I'd be really careful about plugins that do that for you, but that's another podcast. (laughs) Mono compatibility, again, I know I sound like a broken record if anybody is old enough to know what that even means, but... (laughs) It's really important not to ignore mono compatibility. It just is. And, and you can get into trouble when you start putting mics a distance from each other and they're both here in the same source. And one place where that's obvious uh, is on a television show or on a feature when they might maybe have two mics open and you hear an actor walk across the floor and he's talking and you hear a little phasing or flanging in his voice as he walks. And that's because he's changing the distance between the two microphones and it's causing a cancellation. Yeah. But you'll probably only hear that on a mono television. Yeah, right. So there, I've said it again. You know. <laughs> So, with all that in mind, I did three different spaced pair recordings. It might seem a little odd. I did one metre apart as a beginning, and then I did 50 centimetres apart, and then I did 150 centimetres apart. So, let's have a listen to the one metre apart uh, stereo recording. Here we go. Let's just crank through these. This is the 50 centimeter spaced pair. And this is the 1.5 meters apart, so 150 centimeters. So what's what's that in the old language, Doc? Uh, That's seven feet? (laughs) Wait a minute, I need to get my calculator. You got me on meters, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's funny. Uh, so the only meter and I know is peak or RMS. Yeah, right. <laughs> So what I find interesting is looking at those graphics, which I've put in the show notes alongside all of these samples, is seeing how the stereo spread is indicated on those images according to where the microphones are placed. I I found that really interesting. And, And when you go back and look at the XY, which was the first sample we did, although there's some stereo spread there, when you see it on that meter, it's actually very narrow and quite forward in the scope. Yet once you start looking at the spaced pairs, you see that the spread is much wider. Yes. I found I found this really interesting and it certainly gets interesting when you get- Well, that that is showing that is showing you the phase cancellation. That's a visualization of the fact that you are not in perfect polarity or phase exactly. or whatever you want to call it between those two mics. Yeah. All right, so let's move on to the mid side. This this is uh, one that I've had to do a lot of reading about to get my head around. Now, I didn't 
have two microphones from the same manufacturer, which, you know, I didn't have a cardioid mic and a figure eight mic from the same manufacturer. So for this particular recording, what I used was the SE 2200A, which is a large diaphragm condenser. And that's the microphone that I've mentioned a couple of times as being my favorite voiceover mic at, the, at, at work right now, even though we've had our Neumann come back with a brand new capsule. Uh, so this SE 2200A is a gorgeous mic, and I use that as the mid half of the mid side configuration. And for the side half of the mid side configuration, I used my trusty R84 ribbon mic. So essentially the idea here is that your mid microphone, your cardioid mic, will be faced directly at the sound source. And your figure eight microphone should be oriented in such a way that the side null is pointed at the sound source. Now, if you're scratching your head, yes, I'm, I am describing this correctly. You want the two circles of sensitivity, if you think of a figure eight mic in that sense, pointed out to the sides. So they're not pointed towards the sound source. So what the figure eight mic is doing is picking up any reflections and reverb from within the acoustic space in which you're recording and the mid microphone, the cardioid microphone, is getting a direct, you know, monophonic pickup straight from the sound source. So the recording is easy enough, but the mixing down or the decoding is a little more complicated. Let's have a listen to the sample and then we'll come back and we'll describe what you have to do to mix this down. Okay, so that's how it sounds. What do we have to do in order to make this play back? What we've recorded is a cardioid mic to one channel and a figure eight mic to another channel. So we've got two channels of audio, but to play this back in proper mid-side stereo, we need to duplicate the signal coming from the figure eight mic. And you can do that in most DAWs simply by right clicking on the track and go duplicate track. So what you've now got is two instances of the signal from the figure eight mic. And if you've used that feature of duplicate track, both tracks will be sample accurate. And that is absolutely critical. We cannot have these two figure eight tracks out of synchronization with each other. They must be perfectly in sync. The idea is that we want to have both of those tracks side by side. And if you start with them both panned to the center and you flip the polarity of one of them and you don't listen to the mid uh, microphone, then those two signals should cancel each other out. You should hit play on your DAW and not hear a thing. If that happens, everything is good because that's what we want. But what we then do is we pan those tracks hard left and hard right. And what that gives us is an out of phase, if you or out of polarity playback of the figure eight mic. So what we're hearing is a very wide signal. And if you have Insight as a plug-in or you have some other stereo scope, try it. Duplicate that figure eight track, flip the polarity of one, pan them hard left and hard right. And what you'll see is that stereo scope, it just deflects left and right off the baseline and it won't show any information forward of that semi circular scope thing that you see. It's just a solid line across the base. And as you bring the mid microphone back into the mix, it adds 
to the polarity of one side and subtracts from the polarity of the other side to give you this true stereo field of information, which is a combination of both that mid microphone and the two parts of the figure eight microphone, if that makes sense. Is there a better way to describe this, Doc? No, I think you did great. And let me just say that when this is done right, the sound can be absolutely glorious. Oh, yes. It really can. Yeah. And the beauty of Midside is if you so desire, you can choose to adjust the playback level of the two figure eight tracks relative to the mid track and collapse or widen the stereo field as you see fit uh, because your your two figure eight tracks are essentially giving you all of the side information all of the stereo information for that signal where your cardioid mic is just giving you you know a mono close mic sound uh, so by adjusting the ratio between them you can adjust the stereo width and the sense of ambience and there was something else I was going to say. What was it? <laughs> okay. One thing you need to check when you do this, and what if I'm not going to say the word, but what have I been harping on for the last hour? Uh, the there's four letter the, the polarity. It's, it's a four letter word. The four letter word. Uh, mono. Oh, mo- oh mono. yes, yes, yes. Right. Yeah. Mono. Mono compatibility. Yeah. Oh yeah. I actually have had. I've seen disasters where. People have, have really wanted to go for that wide stereo spread, and they didn't have enough of the cardioid front mic in them in there. Right, and that can lead to disaster if, if you don't know what you're doing. So it can sound glorious, but with choice comes the possibility of making the wrong choice. Yeah. Now the question that I hinted at at the beginning of this podcast simply came from my experiments in Reaper as I was preparing to record this episode. What I noticed was that with my mid-microphone panned dead center as it should be, and my two figure eight tracks panned hard left and hard right with one of them, you know, polarity inverted, what I did was to, to make sure that I didn't upset the volume of those two tracks i routed them through a bus so i could just ride the bus up and down mm. and that way i knew that i wasn't altering the left and right bal- you know the the amplitude balance of the left and right tracks accidentally what i did notice is that as i increase the level of the bus track separately from the mid microphone track was a skewing of the stereo image towards one side have i done something wrong or is that something to do with the mid microphone interacting with a certain polarity signal from the side mic or is it because the two sides of the ribbon mic are not exactly perfectly balanced right okay well it could be that but surely that's going to happen with any figure eight mic, wouldn't it? I suppose. I suppose it's possible. Okay. Uh, I haven't run into that, but I suppose that's possible. Uh, separately, I would, I would wonder from you that if the sides sounded a little warmer and mellower since they were a ribbon yeah. and the center sounded a little clearer and brighter because it was a condenser. Uh, I haven't listened to that, but it's quite, yeah, it, it stands to reason that that would be the case. Uh, but this was actually a quite a noticeable shift in the the orientation of the stereo sphere, if you like. Like it, it, it was almost like the mid microphone was suddenly being panned to one side, which was absolutely not happening. I checked that. That was kind of what happened, and and it would only happen as I rode the this bus, which was simply carrying the two ribbon mic signals as i rode that fader up and down relative to the mid mic i would notice this shift in the stereo sphere to to one side and i wasn't sure entirely why that was happening Hmm. Uh, maybe i need to do some more reading yeah i I don't know the answer to that fair enough anything else you want to add to the discussion 
No, I think it's been a pretty good discussion. And since people have these files that they're you know available to them now, yep. uh, they can repeat some of these experiences and, and experiments and listen to mono compatibility and check out how wide the stereo image can be with the MS. And I think that's it's just great for people to have that opportunity. The only question I have is that guitar that you mentioned. Yep. You know, because I'm a I'm a guitar person. Was that a spruce top with a mahogany or a rosewood body because they sound different, or was it cedar top or any of that? Do you, do you have any? Do you know any particulars about that particular guitar? Mate, I'm not a guitarist, <laughs> so I don't know. But I will ask the question of Dan, and I will get that information to you, and I will post it uh, on the on the blog as well. So if anyone's really keen to know what type of guitar it was. <laughs> All well, right. so guitars let's... are a little more mid-rangey than rosewood guitar bodies, and there's different types of spruce for the top, there's Engelman spruce, and there's spruce from Alaska, Sitka. <laughs> so, you know, all these things to people who have guitar acquisition syndrome, or GAS, yeah, like myself, yeah. really badly, you know, we care about these things. These things are, uh, they, they assume a larger role in our lives <laughs> than they should by all, by all rights. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So we've got three more to get through. So let's get through this because this is uh, becoming quite a long podcast. So next up is Bloomline. This is named after British audio engineer, Alan Bloomline, uh, who worked for the, I think it was, was it the BBC he worked for back in the thirties? I think, I I think so. Um, Truly one of the geniuses of of this or any other, other time. I mean, clearly. Yeah. So the Bloomline pair relies on two microphones in a figure eight configuration. Now, sadly, I did not have two mics from the same manufacturer. And for this recording, I've had to use the the Neumann U87, you know, which is a, a condenser mic, and my R84, which is a ribbon mic. And as we have discussed in the past, these mics have really quite substantially different frequency responses. Uh, The ribbon mic is a much warmer sounding microphone uh, than a U87. Uh, I realize that that is not ideal. It's, you know, not the the perfect way to conduct an experiment like this, but it was all that I had at my disposal. So essentially what you've got are two figure eight microphones, which you mount one beneath the other so that one pair is, if, if you were looking down on them from above, one microphone is pointed from you know, northwest to southeast, if you like, relative to your sound source, and the other one is at 90 degrees to that, so it's northeast to southwest. So essentially you've got these four overlapping spheres of sensitivity, almost like a four-leaf clover. And Alan Bloomline, you know, patented this uh, particular technique in 1933, and it has been used extensively since then. And one of the great advantages of Bloomline stereo using two figure eight mics in this configuration is it's almost impossible to end up with any phasing errors you know, the mono compatibility of this technique is rock solid. Uh, you can collapse this to, to mono and not have any issues whatsoever. Uh, Doc, anything you want to add on Bloomline before we have a listen to it? Nope, let's hear it. All righty. Uh, so the next one, this was the one I said I read about in Audio Technology Magazine. This is the Faulkner Phased Array, and this was developed by Tony Faulkner, who does a lot of classical recording. And this is, in, a sens- in essence, a spaced pair, but instead of using cardioid polar patterns, it uses two figure eight patterns as a parallel pair 20 centimeters apart. And in the article in Audio Technology Magazine, which I will have a hunt around, I'll see if there's a link to the article that you can read on the Audio Technology website. If there is, I'll find that link and I'll post it in the show notes. 
a friend of his that he mentioned it to who was a broadcast engineer and deals with antenna arrays said, oh, this is what you're doing. This is a phased array uh, like what we do with transmission antennas to increase the uh, reach of an antenna over a a given distance uh, because you can use certain... I, I didn't quite understand part of what he was saying. It was something to do with phase anomalies between these two signals to try and cancel out certain interferences, which in essence increases the reach of two antennas broadcasting in this uh, fashion. And essentially he was saying that what Tony Faulkner was doing with these two figure eight mics was essentially the same kind of thing. Uh, If anyone can expand on that, uh, and Doc, if you can expand on that, feel free to (laughs) shed some light. No, not really. No, (laughs) you have this one. (laughs) Take, Take this ball and go long. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So again, using a U87 and an R84, again, not the perfect combination. Ideally, you would have two mics from the same manufacturer that were the same model of microphone. Uh, but this is how they sound. And the last one is ORTF, and I'm not even going to try and uh, pronounce it. It's it's all in French. It was developed by the French equivalent of the BBC or, you know, the American Broadcasting Corporation, if you like. Uh, it is their national broadcaster. And essentially what ORTF is, it's like binaural, but without the physical obstruction in between the two microphones. So we haven't addressed binaural in this conversation and we probably should have. And and I guess the reason I didn't is because I don't have a binaural dummy head to use. The idea of binaural recording is that you have a fake head or a dummy head made out of, I think they usually use a, a foam material and they shape ears on the side of the dummy head and they embed inside the dummy head two omnidirectional microphones placed if you will where the middle ear would be on the side of the dummy head and so the idea is to mimic what we as human beings hear when we walk around on this planet so sounds which arrive from dead in front, arrive at both of our ears pretty much simultaneously. But if a sound is off to one side, say the left side, then that sound arrives at our left ear marginally quicker than the sound waves which travel around the side of our head and eventually reach our right ear. And the timing differences, as well as the amplitude differences because obviously that sound which has to travel a little further around our head is going to drop in amplitude by the time it reaches our right ear so that combination of both timing differences and amplitude differences picked up by our two ears sends a signal to our brain which says that sound is slightly earlier and slightly louder in the left ear than the right ear, therefore that sound is coming to us from the left-hand side. And you you can then imagine for yourself how that varies according to where a sound is in relation to your head. So a binaural dummy head aims to mimic exactly what we hear as humans. And by using omnidirectional microphones, it means that sound which arrives from above the head will... recreate in such a way that it sounds like when you play it back like the sound is coming from above which is quite freaky if you've ever listened to a binaural recording and i need to just state here when you listen to a binaural recording you need to listen with either earbuds or headphones putting them through a a speaker system is a waste of time the whole point of binaural is to get those sounds entering your ears directly not traveling through space to your ears is absolutely freaky. 
It is a really freaky experience the first time you hear it, particularly if you get some stuff that's been recorded with, you know, things happening very close to the omnidirectional microphones in the dummy head and other things which are happening further away. Because when you listen back to it, you know, played back through earbuds or headphones, you get the full experience of the timing differences, the intensity differences, the sense of distance is recreated in ways that all of these stereo techniques, you know, to my mind, just don't even come close to. So the idea of ORTF, to get back to, to this, to ORTF, it is almost an identical configuration microphone-wise in that you have the microphone capsules 17 centimetres apart. That's a little bit over six inches, maybe about seven inches for the, the, the folks on the other side of the pond. 17 centimetres is roughly what we believe to be the distance between our ears you know, for an adult human being. Obviously, children, heads are a little narrower, but, but generally for adult humans, our ears are 17 centimetres apart. So these capsules are 17 centimetres apart, and they are at 110 degrees relative to each other. And I think, you know, they, they settled on that figure because if you looked at a human head from above, looking down on top, our ears are splayed outwards slightly. And when I say our ears, I'm referring to the pinna, the soft fleshy bit on the side of your skull. They are splayed outwards slightly to collect sound that arrives from in front of us slightly more so than the sound which arrives from behind. And so I think that 110 degree spread for ORTF is probably based on that idea that, you know, the pinna are slightly angled in that sense. <laughs> anyway, so this is ORTF recorded with my Rode M5 matched pair. And, uh, Oh, and, and I should state that the capsules are facing outwards. They're not faced inwards the way we do with a coincident pair. Uh, I will put links in the show notes to all of these different techniques. There's a couple of different sites I've found that I'll link to uh, so you can get some ideas of pictures. On top of that, there's all the photographs I've taken during this recording session uh, that show where I had microphones set up. So, uh, uh, Doc, anything to add on ORTF? No, no, but I, I would just add that it really does sound amazing. The first time I heard this, I couldn't believe it. it. It just really is. It can be startling, especially if you're recording something that's been manipulated to sound like it's something that you don't want near you. I suspect that this is something that was very important to early man when there was saber-toothed tigers sneaking up behind him, <laughs> you know, to know what where something was coming from, right? Definitely. To be able to hear, to hear that little creak in the bushes that told you that there was something with big teeth on your left side about four meters back. So, yeah. Uh, and this really, it, this really can work. Definitely. All right, so let's wrap this up. This is the ORTF sample, and uh, we'll wrap it up after this. Can I, can I say one thing before you play it? Sure. You mentioned classical music earlier, and I just want to take this opportunity to tip my hat to the men and women who record classical music out there because these people go through a lot of training. Yes. And they really do an amazing job, and they're not messing around. These people really deserve all the accolades I can give them. And, and uh, I just wanted to say that on the air. That, and, uh, that is a great point, Doc. That is a great point. I, I think... You know, the people that are involved in the recording of classical music tend to take their microphone placement and their choice of microphones a heck of a lot more seriously than a lot of the, dare I say it, cowboys who are involved in recording of rock and pop music. Yahoo! <laughs> I wasn't pointing at you. <laughs> I don't think you're a cowboy by any stretch of the imagination. Well, I'm more of a I, I'm more of a post production person, but you know, um, I, I never let a good joke go by without you know saying <laughs> yeah. it. But you know, I think of you, yeah, your anecdote from earlier in this episode where you've had a band who've come to you with an, an album they've just finished mixing, and there's you know complete evidence of you know cowboy engineering at its finest. 
you know, allowing a mix out of the studio where the guitar's completely null. Like, seriously, that's just inexcusable. And yet, other than that, all the other songs were very well mixed, very carefully thought out. Sure. Um, unlike a lot of engineers, he didn't have too much EQ or too much compression or whatever. All of his choices were uh, legitimate for the style of music. Nice. You know, nice. all of those things were done really well until this song came along. And then it was like, <laughs> oh, you know, yeah. uh, it only sounds great in stereo. Yeah. It's, you know. <laughs> yeah. That'd be a good title for a book. <laughs> It only sounded good in stereo. Yes. <laughs> nice. All right. So let's listen to the last sample. This is OITF. Awesome. Okay, so that does it for our quite lengthy wrap-up of stereo miking techniques. As I have mentioned, there will be download links in the show notes to all of the WAV files that I captured during this recording session, as well as some rendered versions that I've already mixed down, if anyone wants to listen to those in WAV format. They're the same versions that you've heard in this podcast, except they'll be in WAV format, not MP3. There's links in the show notes to those couple of websites that have got diagrams explaining placement of microphones and which polar patterns should go where and all that sort of stuff. I've also posted a link to recordinghacks.com who posted a similar type of experiment a couple of, or actually seven years ago now, it was 2010. He used himself playing a drum kit. Uh, and did all these different stereo miking techniques on a drum kit. And all of the samples on his blog post are sadly in MP3. It it probably does the job, but I I would love to have heard WAVs just to know that there was no encoding artifacts messing with the stereo imaging of those files. Uh, But they, they are great samples to listen to as well. So I highly recommend, if you're interested in stereo miking techniques and how it can apply to different things, go and check out the samples at recordinghacks.com because those, like I said, it's a full drum kit. So it's a much wider sound source at its core than a single acoustic guitar. So definitely check that out. And uh, I think that's pretty much all that I needed to... Oh, I also have a link to a thread on gearsluts.com where there's a bunch of guys talking all about stereo miking techniques. There's a guy called Kiwi Burger who put a very insightful post, about third post down in the thread, which sounded very authoritative, but he seemed to cop a little bit of flack from some other people in the thread later on, but it, it makes for interesting reading as well. So anyone that's uh, wanting to expand their knowledge on stereo miking techniques, go and have a read of that thread as well. Anything to wrap up, Doc? No, stop, stop me before I go off on yet another tangent. <laughs> no, please, go, go, go nuts. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> No, I'm good. I'm really good. Thank you, Bruce. Excellent, mate. All right. Well, good to chat with you again. You too. All right. And we'll catch you in a couple of weeks. See you, mate. Oh, yeah. And keep those cards and letters coming, by the way. Definitely. Definitely. We want to hear some feedback on this episode. We put a lot of time and effort into it. I'd I'd certainly like to know that somebody's getting something from it. All right, mate. Talk to you in a couple of weeks. Bye. Sign language. Another audio to you.com quality podcast. For questions, comments, and feedback, email the boys at signlanguagepodcast.com.